Welcome. Um, my name is Sky Elijah. Uh, this talk is on the idea of a cashless society. I will try. <laughs> um, I am a financial activist. I work with um, alternative um, monetary systems and um, alternative financial technology. I'm really interested in kind of the nature of money and its role in society. I've worked in the Bitcoin industry for the past several years, um, so I'm kind of both uh, somewhat of an expert on that, but also uh, fairly critical about the uh, Bitcoin community um, as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But first, I um, just kind of wanted to gauge the room. How many of you, when you're making daily purchases, um, prefer to use cash. Is there anybody who almost never uses cash? Wow, so that's probably more. Okay. Um, is there anybody in here who uses uh, cryptocurrency? And how about people who have never used cryptocurrency? Um, is there anybody in here who uh, doesn't have a, um, a bank account or a bank card to make purchases with? I, I did until a month ago. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, I'll start by talking a little bit about kind of uh, the fundamental nature of money, um, which is often uh, deliberately skewed in modern uh, perception of, of money. But if you kind of go back to like the fundamental basis of society, right? You have people, they produce things, they produce goods and services, and those goods and services have value. Uh, so in order to exchange things, um, we've, we've never really exchanged value for value. Uh, what monetary exchange does is we exchange value for something uh, that is a claim upon future value. And there's kind of this uh, mythology uh, about the primitive form of exchange in human society being value exchanged for value in the form of barter. Uh, and this is kind of a, a myth about how did money evolve. And the, the, the kind of the imagination is that money evolved to become a more efficient way of bartering because bartering was hard. But bartering actually is not a natural form of monetary exchange. And historically, there isn't any, any record of bartering being um, a system that money spontaneously emerges from. The original forms of exchange within communities, early communities uh, have systems of um, uh, sort of mutual indebtedness to each other. So in, in small groups, if you think about, you know, if you go camping with a bunch of friends or you go to um, like Burning Man or something uh, and you're, you're working with a bunch of people, you tend to be really collaborative and exchange a lot of what you have and what you brought and invested in. Um, and they will exchange that with you in, in kind of a, a really ad hoc way. And if you think about those situations, you don't necessarily need to keep a very careful control um, and record of who owes who, um, you know, who is, who owes who a favor or who, you know, drank all of the beers or whatever, because people just remember. 
or you know like you know if someone in your friend group is really like not reciprocating uh, what the other people in the friend group are doing and that tends to um, have kind of a natural uh, management system in human society where those people will tend to be excluded if they don't you know pull their own weight socially speaking so original forms of exchange tended to be around this idea that you have some sort of um, uh, mutual reciprocity and and that you are bound into the social fabric by your kind of inherent indebtedness to the people within your community who put forth uh, value that you benefit from. And you have sort of an expectation that you will also put forth value and they will benefit from that. So it's fundamentally different from a barter system, which is really based on very little trust, where it's like, you can only take this thing of value if you give me something of equal value right now. Um, so that's, that's kind of on a underlying fundamental social level, that's kind of like where money came from in society. And there's a, there's kind of a, um, another mythology that, that cash is like this proto form of money, right? That it, it was the original form of money and that later we invented these systems that we now have as like digital databases. Mm, it's more ac historically, it's more accurate um, to kind of think of money as one means of implementing a money system, but not the only one, and that it's always been like that. Um, it's equally uh, useful in certain situations to establish just a more formalized system of that kind of mutual reciprocity where you have a ledger system where somebody is in charge of keeping track of who owes who. And as you know, societies get bigger and more complex, um, you know, it became necessary to have some system of keeping track of who owes who. You don't necessarily need a token to do that. You, if you have somebody who's trusted to just keep track of everybody's score, and then when exchange happens, you communicate with that entity and you tell them, "I'm I'm giving, you know, this person uh, this much value, and so their my score changes <coughs> by minus that amount, and their score changes by plus that amount." And the people who are wealthy within society accumulate a high score, and that's how you um, gain wealth within a society like that. If you have um, like cash, how you gain wealth is by accumulating a big pile of it physically. And in order to exchange, you hand that instrument straight to another person. So that's called a bearer instrument. It's something that you hold in your hand and you don't need to, to communicate with a third party in order to make that exchange. So those are kind of like the two main categories of monetary instruments, is ledger systems that have some sort of database um, and some, some entity controlling that database, uh, and then bearer instruments, which are something that you hold and you control uh, and there are sort of uh, mutually recognized with the people that you are exchanging with. Um, so digital currency, for those of you who are, have kind of been following, um, you know, the rise of Bitcoin and other altcoins and, and various uh, decentralized uh, digital ledger um, and digital database technology currencies, um, you may have heard kind of a, a loose array of sort of buzzwords to describe them. And one of, one of the key ways that people describe Bitcoin is as being uh, digital cash. Have any of you heard that? 
being called that. Um, and, and in fact, the original white paper even referred to Bitcoin as a digital cash. And in some ways, that makes sense because it does mimic some of that relationship of um, you have something that you control and you feel like you're giving it directly to another person when you exchange with them. But in fact, if you kind of look at the um, the actual un like actual structure of how Bitcoin works, it's it exactly mirrors the ledger system. The only difference is that instead of a centralized entity like say a trusted person who is elected it within society to control this database, instead of that you have this technology that, that allows everybody to um, uh, sort of mutually um, agree upon uh, the same information at the same time. But it's often said that it's, it's a way of digitally exchanging without an inter intermediary. Um, and I would say that that's not quite accurate because you still have to, in order to exchange, you still have to uh, send a message to this database. And even though the database is distributed, it's still an intermediary, but it's just a distributed inter intermediary. Sorry. So you have to send a message to this, to the people who control the database, which in the case of Bitcoin, those are called the miners. Uh, and then they kind of validate that make the change within the database and then you and the person you're exchanging with have to then go and check to see that that has happened um, which is a an evolution of a ledger system not of a, of a cash system so it's just a kind of a i think a misconception that's maybe not very helpful to people that when we call bitcoin digital cash that kind of, you know, conflates, um, you know, these digital intermediaries with something that isn't a digital intermediary. And so it becomes very hard for people to actually recognize that there is this intermediary. There's often this kind of imagination that we can escape certain elements of, you know, power structures within society by decentralizing them. I think it's important um, to recognize that by decentralizing them, we are changing certain elements of them, but we're not fundamentally invalidating um, the fact that there are still intermediaries. And those intermediaries hold power on the ability to exchange with people. So, um, this concept of a cashless society, it's becoming kind of more popular in the last few years. Um, how many of you have encountered that phrase before, cashless society? It's, it's sometimes called a cashless economy. Um, there's various, in, in like the fintech industry, um, where I've, I've worked um, in the last few years and in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of this narrative of uh, you know cashless society being this inevitable um, evolution of the arc of you know technology and the arc of society and that this is a benefit to everybody and it's inevitable and um, it's kind of our bright and shiny brave new world and so it's it's presented as being something that you shouldn't fight because it's inevitable and that it's going to, to really make your life better um, and it's something that you should probably just get on board with. That's kind of how it's presented to society. There's a, there's a couple different reasons for that, but um, I guess my main point is that that narrative is very deliberate. It's, a, it's an exceptionally deliberate um, kind of cultural manipulation that's happening as a joint effort of corporate interests and um, uh, governments 
and they have different reasons for wanting um, to move to a cashless society. Uh, and they're, it's not, they're not necessarily straightforward about those reasons, although some of them, they are. A lot of the reasons that you hear um, have to do with um, kind of uh, consumer convenience, right? Like, it's gonna be really cool. You can just use your contactless payment card when you're riding the bus. You don't have to fumble with change at um, checkout. Uh, you know, you just tap and go. It's gonna be great. You use your phone. You don't have to like ha use this old fashioned, you know, grocery cash because we live in the shiny future where we just tap our phone or our um, our cards, etc. Um, there's another kind of narrative coming from uh, governments uh, that moving to a cashless society will stamp out a lot of um, black market activity um, and will make it so that people um, are less able to evade um, taxation. Um, and that's kind of the um, dominant government rationale. And one of the examples you might have heard of recently is what happened in India um, a few months ago where overnight the government said, okay, basically every denomination of, of uh, cash over like $10 is now worthless and you must exchange at the bank. Um, and this is just like total unprecedented, um, like shocking move. And they did it to kind of force people who'd maybe been storing their savings under their mattress to put it into the bank so it could then be taxed, so it could then be registered and monitored, so that the government would then know who has what money. Um, and the, you know, the rationale is that this will benefit society by, um, you know, making a lot of these like unsavory, seedy black market uses of cash um, will we'll wipe that out of society. Um, and this is, I mean, it seems like, it, you know, depending on how moralistic you are and how much you agree with um, the regulations of your government, it seems like that might be a reasonable thing to, for a government to claim. Um, but it it's actually kind of works on this fallacy that, um, like, black market um, and gray market and, uh, you know, off uh, the books monetary movement happens primarily in cash, where in fact, most of it happens within the banking sector. You guys heard of, um, it was last year, um, Mosek Fonseca uh, revealed um, all of these leaked documents about how the world's richest people were hiding their money and hiding it from the government and from uh, anybody who would try to figure out who owned what and who had what money. And this very elaborate system within the world of these offshore bank accounts, these um, you know different ways and of hiding money. And these people, they're not hiding cash, they're hiding bank deposits. So the idea that eliminating cash from society is going to do away with this unsavory um, activity is, is really quite um, inaccurate and, and really, I think, um, disingenuous. Where the most powerful people, the people who have real corruption and real money, they're, they, they're not concerned with hiding cash. Like cash is, is really, something that's useful for people who um, may be on the margins of society, who may not fit in um, exactly with the um, moral or um, legal structure of the, um, the place that they live. 
Um, and a lot of those people tend to be on the much more vulnerable side of society. Sometimes they're dissidents, um, sometimes they're journalists or people who speak out about um, things within their government or they have uh, you know, gray market activities that the government would rather they didn't do. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily about um, really like cleaning up society by getting rid of cat. Um, the, other, the other point I guess I was trying to make here is that um, cashless society is kind of a weird term because it sort of begs the question of like, okay, well, if we're not using cash, what is it that we are using? And it really sort of focuses on something being not cash without really stating what is it that we'll be using then if we're not using cash in this wonderful cashless society. Uh, and it's really, the answer is that we'll be locked into a bank money system where you have to ask your bank uh, to edit the ledger that they control um, and that they will have full control over all of your money and whether or not you can move it, who you can move it to, who you can accept payments from. It's really becoming a bank money society, a bank payments society. And I, I think if it was presented in that way, it would be maybe less shiny sounding. It would be less of an easy sell in Silicon Valley because it's not necessarily about this advanced technology. It's really about squeezing off access um, to something that we've always, we, we've had access to um, for a very long time um, and not, not squeezing it off for our benefit, but for authoritarian structures and for corporate benefit. Uh, so I've kind of talked about this a bit. Um, there's a lot of movement in technological innovation, uh, especially in financial technology sector, uh, towards increasingly uh, digital systems, increasingly automated systems, um, increasingly touchless, convenient systems. And a lot of the, the technology has to do with kind of like the user interface layer of how people interact with bank databases. So it's not necessarily a lot of innovation on how money actually works in society, but just how we interface with the very end user component of that. Uh, and that's maybe a little bit dangerous within society because we have kind of a blind spot for recognizing the power that technological systems hold uh, over our um, behavior and perception and access to things. So it may be um, that most people in society do have a bank account and do have payment cards that they can use, but there is a non-trivial amount of society that falls outside of kind of the cost-benefit breakdown of what a, who a bank wants to serve. And so they're left outside of that. Um, and that's, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't matter to people who think that everybody has a bank account and everybody has roughly the same amount of, you know, wealth and income that they do. But there's, uh, you know, there are um, vulnerable people on the edges of society who, um, will have a disproportionate amount of exclusion from society uh, in a system that they are locked into these technological structures that they don't actually fit within. And so m the more that we move to exclusively using uh, technological systems uh, as our part of the social fabric of society, the more that we kind of risk um, locking ourselves into these 
powerful structures that are really hard to perceive. Uh, and it's, you know, financial technology is very much like that. And I, and I would say not, not only corporate financial technology, but also even um, decentralized digital, you know, cryptocurrency. I think that there's some risk in there of also having uh, these powerful structures uh, either get replicated or emerge because they're so hard for us to recognize. So they tend to, um, we tend to just kind of like accidentally recreate them. Like that's that's how power replicates. Um, this is a picture of um, Le the Leviathan from um, by Thomas Hobbes. So it. The Leviathan is this uh, kind of construct that in order to run um, society, what we should do is give up a certain amount of our freedom to some sovereign entity who would then rule over society and enable us to mutually interact with each other um, because they have the power to um, kind of like mediate markets and exchange. And the, the idea, um, you know, Thomas Hobbes was kind of trying to create this, uh, uh, you know, theory of, of society back in like the Byzantine era. And uh, he had this really dim view of <coughs> human nature. Um, and he basically thought that, you know, left to their own devices, humans will basically just destroy each other. And so you can't run a market without somebody controlling people because they'll just rip each other off. Um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it, it reflects a really kind of a dim view of humanity. Um, and it was a, one of the uh, kind of justifications for creating these systems of authority within um, society. And you can kind of like still see that structure um, in, in the systems that we create today. Uh, and, and technologically speaking, there's kind of a really similar um, appeal to this idea of, okay, we need to defer some of our own agency to these technological systems, and then we'll let the technological systems control some certain aspect of our lives, and that will enable us to easily interact with each other. So financial systems are kind of precisely that. That makes some sense. Um, so as far as corporate interests go, um, it's, uh, it's immensely beneficial to say Visa or um, your bank um, and the payments industry to have sole control over processing your payments. If you think about a cash transaction uh, Visa benefits not at all from that, right? They make no money. They don't know what you bought. They can't mine it for data. They don't get their interchange fee from it. Um, so that's useless to them. So it's obvious that as far as Visa and all other payment companies are concerned, a move to a cashless system is of huge benefit. And so we should be immediately suspicious of everything they say just for that reason. Right? Because it's, it's, in, it's immensely beneficial. The more and more that we do these centralized digital payment systems, the greater their um, ability to monitor our transactions, to understand um, these complex things about our lives, to predict what we're going to want to buy in the future, to understand what our buying habits are, to understand what our financial sis like situation is, um, because they can use all of that data to make money. That's their business. So we are, you know, playing into that um, uh, interest if we're pursuing a cashless society, and uh, you know. You may have your own views on if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it's definitely something that we need to keep in mind when we see things um, like 
you know, advertisements for how, you know, in the future we're going to feel weird about using cash because it's so old fashioned. You know, they, there's a deliberate, you know, cultural push to kind of make us feel awkward about using cash in the future. Like, that's what, you know, people who aren't technologically advanced do. You know, we have all this fun, shiny technology. We, you know, we've evolved past that. Um, so it's something to be kind of like keep an eye out for and be suspicious of. And, and then also the ability for, um, you know, transactions to be monitored has its own slew of uh, issues. And in a hypothetical situation in which we have a cashless society, um, we really have this kind of financial panopticon on a degree that we've never experienced before. I mean, we have a lot of financial surveillance and, um, you know, a feeling of, of being watched by corporates and by governments as it is. Um, but if we remove, you know, our opportunity to have these private interactions, even just, you know, casual, um, you know, you uh, uh, tip a busker on the street with a dollar, like, to be able to do that without having to involve, um, you know, a third party who watches that transaction, um, you know, that's a, that's a really dramatic fundamental shift um, that we've never encountered before. You know, we've had a lot of technology that's come in and really changed the way that, um, you know, privacy works within society. But this is something that is different from what we faced in the past, and I think it, it has it's potentially one of the biggest, um, you know, threats to society that we're facing is this, uh, you know, kind of insidious, slow um, uh, overtaking of our financial um, interactions that happen. Um, away from the eyes of, uh, you know, Big Brother or whatever. And the danger of a panopticon is not, it's not just like the Big Brother kind of mythology of, you know, oh, if you do something wrong, you're going to get in trouble because everyone is watching you. Um, or that if you are, if you do do something, um, that you'll get caught for it. Um, it's more like kind of the subtle shift in behavior that happens when you know you're being watched, right? Like if, you, if you're alone in your house or your apartment or whatever, um, you know, you might kind of like dance around to the radio or, you know, sing along with a song that comes on or something that you wouldn't necessarily do if your roommates were home. And it's not anything profound. It's just there's a thing about, you know, being yourself in, in the privacy of, uh, you know, um, a, a situation that you, you don't feel monitored that's really important for kind of the health of um, a free society. And uh, we have a lot of evidence that as people feel monitored, even subtly, their behavior does change. Uh, on social media, if you, f if you feel you are being watched, um, people are less likely to post um, opinions that are maybe subversive. Uh, that, that's a, you know, it's a well-documented effect, and it happens uh, with all kinds of technology when people just subtly self-censor themselves. And that's really kind of like the most dangerous aspect of surveillance technology. It's not, it, it's the ability to get people to basically police themselves. Because then you don't have to police them, right? That's, that's very convenient um, if you're an authority structure. Um, and financially speaking, um, you know, having no ability to step outside of 
the standard system to make um, informal transactions or if you are in a situation that you need to hide your transaction, to not have that ability is really, um, is, you know, it's a subtle shift in how uh, the fabric of society functions. And I, I think that it's necessary for a healthy society to have um, access to privacy and that we've never really encountered a situation um, where we've not had any financial privacy before. But a cashless system, like a real and true cashless system, um, holds that threat in a way that we've never really encountered before. So some other issues um, with cashless systems um, that are sometimes not uh, readily thought of. Um, one of them is dependence on physical infrastructure. So we've heard in the last couple of like weeks and months of a couple of like random outages of either power or the internet based on either the grid going down or you know DDoS attacks or some centralized um, you know frailty in our internet system. So it's uh, you know it's important to think about um, what what we're pinning our ability to um, transact in any capacity. Um, you know what structures we're relying on if we move to that. And this is something that uh, decentralized uh, cryptocurrencies also are vulnerable to. So if you have to have the internet functioning in order to um, transact, that could be a problem in certain circumstances. Uh, and it's, you know, I think it's not unreasonable uh, to think of a future scenario in which some part of uh, the world, you know, had like does not have access to what they need to have access to, um, and without the ability to say um, use cash to you know buy a train ticket out of whatever like apocalyptic situation you find yourself in, um, you know you're in a much more vulnerable situation than if you have at least hypothetical access to you know whatever cash you had lying around. You can go to a different country if you need to um, and use that. Whereas if your country's uh, digital system is down, um, you know that's that's just not an option. So that's worth thinking about. Um, censorship is a, another issue that um, a centralized cashless payment system is really vulnerable to. Uh, and we can kind of see how this happens if we look at something like PayPal. Um, PayPal has the ability to unilaterally, um, of their own volition, of whatever uh, rationale they have privately, they can shut somebody off in terms of receiving or sending payments. They don't have to have a reason for doing it. Um, they can just do that. If they don't like you, they can shut you off. Um, and if that's your only option for making a transaction, that can be um, a really extreme way of marginalizing somebody. If you think of, you know, um, like an activist group, if the government or if PayPal or whoever um, didn't like the actions of some group um, and they wanted to. Uh, um, you know, stifle their activity. They very easily just turn them all off. And they can, at that point, you know, they can no longer go and, and print uh, flyers for their march. They can't, you know, use the subway. Yeah. There is precedent for this. So, uh, PayPal blocked all donations to Haiti in December of this year. Exactly. And, um, you know, they, they just decided WikiLeaks, um, you know, we don't like what you're doing. Um, if it weren't for cryptocurrency, WikiLeaks would not have been able to continue accepting the donations that has enabled them to operate from then until now. Uh, 
and so it's you know it's a it's a powerful thing and as we kind of see what's happening with our government these days um, there's perhaps more reason to be concerned that behavior that was maybe once acceptable could in a fu in the future um, be looked upon as not acceptable and so even even if you don't think of yourself as being potentially outside of the mainstream system we really don't know who's going to be in power in the future so it's you know it's it's important to not hand over um, you know th these elements of power um, to kind of just like see what the future wants to do with them so um, like I mentioned with WikiLeaks um, decentralization of uh, digital systems of, of digital currency um, is a really interesting movement and it's a really interesting um, you know way of innovating financial technology um, I would say we shouldn't like fetishize it though because it is still a power structure um, it's not inherently empowering uh, as kind of people within the Bitcoin community have found out that just because you decentralize a system doesn't mean that the people who run that system are then empowered unless they have some agency or some way of participating in a decision-making process about the future of that network and right now Bitcoin does not have that system so people within Bitcoin have discovered there's no way of making decisions and it's a really big problem and nobody knows how to solve it um, and it's interesting because it's not really what people expected to happen um, but it, it's uh, it's problematic in that it, it kind of shows that decentralization isn't necessarily going to lead to some form of like collective emancipation from these structures of power like politics you can't get away from politics. They're going to be there. You're going to have to deal with them in some capacity. So decentralization, I think, is a really powerful idea. I'm definitely in favor of it in many ways, um, but it's not necessarily kind of like the end-all, be-all solution to something like the authoritarianism of a cashless society. Uh, what attempts have been made, if any, to so um, if you think of it's kind of like a um, it's like if you went and cut off the head of a centralized entity because you wanted to break down this system that um, is abusing people in society because there's this disproportionate amount of power and so you say okay we're gonna break that down we're gonna take away the centralized um, you know control structure we're gonna distribute it amongst everybody within the group um, the problem is that if you do that you may have gotten rid of the head of this you know problematic entity but you may have also gotten rid of um, you know the ability to appeal to anything to have any control over the future <coughs> of that system so uh, you know somebody within the system uh, may not actually have any uh, you know real power in terms of um, offering solutions deciding on solutions um, the future of what happens and within Bitcoin, um, you know, the kind of like the, where it came to, um, you know, a really problematic apparent um, conflict is this, uh, what's called the block size debate. So, you know, a decision had to be made about how are we going to deal, um, you know, with this problem as the network is scaling and are we gonna go in this direction or that direction? And um, it being decentralized, it turns out that there's uh, that um, you know uh, um, consensus-based governance 
is actually kind of like a crappy way of doing governance because in the context of a network good, it doesn't actually work. And same thing with like in open source, there's this idea, well, if you don't like it, you can just fork the system. But in a network good, that doesn't work because in a network good, it becomes more valuable the more people use it. So it's just like with Facebook, like a lot of people don't like Facebook, but um, alternatives to Facebook are not usually very successful because people have, um, so there's so much more value to people in this system that everybody's already using, that it's very hard to make a shift by saying, okay, I've replicated the system, but I made this one improvement. Because there's no motivation for people to switch, even if it is technically superior. And that's definitely happened with Bitcoin. A lot of the altcoins are kind of like that. And you know, people have no real uh, motivation to switch because the value of Bitcoin is that everybody's using it, right? And so even if you have this technically superior alternative, unless everyone's using it, it's not really that valuable to you. So you get kind of locked into this system um, and kind of like de facto, the power ends up um, lying with people who have the greatest access to um, you know, capital and resources within the system, which is remarkably similar to the system that it was trying to replace, right? Um, so it's, uh, you know, the actual, like the individual person within the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin community doesn't actually have any say whatsoever about the actions of everybody else. So it's, uh, it's complicated and uh, it's not, it's not a, uh, a real functional solution yet, but it, it definitely is something that's really interesting. It's, you know, in active kind of development. It's a, a you know, gigantic social experiment. And um, yeah, but I mean, it's also kind of a mess. So if anybody has any brilliant ideas on how to solve that, I'm sure they would love to hear that. Uh, I would, um, I just kind of end with encouraging people to, um, to be really, uh, you know, kind of critical about things that um, we're told about um, money and the technology around it um, and how we use it and kind of the, um, the future of money, something in startup culture, um, Silicon Valley kind of philosophy, uh, it's, uh, it gets really tangled up with these narratives about saving the world and, you know, changing society for the better. And there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of loosely coherent philosophical ideas about society, um, that are convenient to the process of innovation, like technological innovation, um, but kind of don't really look at um, a more holistic picture of what is, what is the actual impact of, um, from a broader perspective on society. Uh, and I think that's something that we just kind of want to develop a more critical consciousness about um, ideas around money, because it's something that has a lot of control over our lives, um, it has a lot of control over people who have much less um, power than we do. You know, in, in many other countries, people who are kind of at the mercy of the dominant financial structure that they're um, constituents of, uh, you know, especially here in America, the the choices that we make about our financial system and about the role um, it plays within our culture have rippling effects around the world. One of the things about the United States that's a little bit interesting in this context is that we're not necessarily the leaders in terms of moving towards a capitalist society. Um, relatively speaking, um, there are other countries that are much further along um, and much more um, ingrained into that cultural shift than we are. 
and our financial system technology history thing is actually quite far behind a lot of these other countries like we only just moved to the chip um, card system we're about 10 years behind the rest of the world <laughs> uh, that being said um, you know places like the UK like Amsterdam um, you know parts of Europe India um, you know they are uh, much they you know they they've been sort of co-opted by these corporate and governmental narratives much more so than we have yet and that's kind of like we can what we can expect to happen over the next decade or so um, which gives us the opportunity um, to fight back in a more meaningful way uh, just as a culture and when you know governments partner with payment companies and say okay we're gonna phase out um, being able to pay for the bus with cash you know that's something that we should stand up and say actually that's not good for society that's that's really problematic it's really harmful and we're not going to just accept it because you have a pretty poster that says something about you know donating to charity and making it all look you know really well packaged so I think it's something um, we have an opportunity to really uh, fight back against in, in a fairly meaningful way, yeah. I would have a little bit more urgency to this problem. I, would you consider the, uh, all of the U.S. Uh, dollars to pay for ocean, uh, which are things that are good real products in the United States, but not really paid for by, <laughs> by a large conglomerate? Yeah. So we are technically already in a capitalist society. Well, we, I mean, in a way we are, in another, in other ways we're still quite a ways off from it. Um, but yeah, it, I absolutely agree. I mean, the urgency of it is really, um, you know, it's it's quite extreme, and especially with such an unstable, um, you know, uh, political environment that we're dealing with. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth keeping in mind, cash is the only way we can access um, like the public form of money or state money. And the money that's in your bank account is technically just IOUs for that money. And so the idea of your bank account is your bank is saying, okay, we promise that if you want, you can have access to this amount of, of state money. They do that through withdrawals and ATM machines. And the idea of taking that away is that you can then no longer have any access to this public form of state money. It's an interesting surreal line, and probably the majority of us in here have faced this one time or another. To access our money, we have to pay the institution to give me our money. Yeah. We have to pay for the privilege of checks pay for transactions, pay for bottles. So we really don't even have the full value of our own money that's been earned. Yeah, I, I agree. A quick anecdote. Uh, anecdote. <clears throat> when I was in Japan in 2004, I witnessed people uh, using near field communications and paying at the convenience store with their phones. Um, and just recently, Japan legalized uh, the use of Bitcoin uh, mm -hmm. officially. And I think there's a number of new exchanges that are opening up in Japan for Bitcoin. So I could see Japan going one of two ways, or maybe both. But I think like uh, you present really good critiques, uh, I think, of Bitcoin that we shouldn't fetishize it, um, and we should be critical of the capitalist society narrative. I absolutely agree. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's maybe important to pose the question of what should we start to move towards if you know time is short and we have to choose something, mm -hmm. you know maybe we should be um, investing in uh, learning about these decentralized models, which kind of diffuse the power, mm -hmm. um, but then it can create confusion and chaos, and we have to find new ways of, of governing uh, ourselves and making decisions. But I think it's very empowering to just like I like Bitcoin because I know the total supply of money that will ever exist in the system. And you'll never know that with US dollars or yen or anything else. So in that way, it's already empowering uh, for me and for many people. Um, and yes, there's problems with it, but you know, 
I think it's a huge difference uh, between this decentralized model that's still experimental, we're working out the kinks maybe and finding new ways of de de uh, managing it versus this Leviathan that you, that you talked about. I think that's a lot scarier. Yeah, I would say one of the, um, the strengths of decentralization um, in general is, uh, is that um, systems uh, with diversity are more resilient. So it's one of, I think, the arguments for protecting cash as an element of our society is, is not that we want to go and use only cash, but that it's important um, for a resilient economy to have diversity in options. Um, and in terms of like what, what do we want to move towards, um, well, we should remember that right now we already have cash. It works really well. It's pretty efficient. Um, it's, it's pretty cheap to use as consumers. Um, you know, it's obviously not perfect, but it's uh, it, in terms of adding resilience to society, I think it's an important element of that. So yeah, I, I don't think we have the comment. not attached to their name, it's whoever owns that particular key that owns their Bitcoin. So it's essentially a bearer instrument on a ledger. I mean, sort of, but on the other hand, it isn't. Like, you don't hold Bitcoins, you can never hold Bitcoins. <laughs> you know, no. they, they exist on the blockchain, um, and that's it. And you just communicate with the blockchain, and you can change, um, you know, ownership of, of access to those things. So I would I would say it really isn't a bearer instrument. It really a lot of bearer instruments in our economy that aren't. I mean, you have like certain bonds and things which have hard blocks that are paid to whoever holds this, but it's not an actual value. It's just a this is we're going to pay you X amount whoever owns this. I mean, that's kind of the way. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, mo most things are not absolutes. And I, w I would say Bitcoin is, isn't an absolute in terms of ledger versus bearer. Um, but I think it, uh, the fundamental technology of Bitcoin is the ledger. So it's, we want to not kind of like delude ourselves that it is cash. It's not bad that it's a ledger. I think it's important just to kind of like try to keep that in mind. In terms of like, could we do Bitcoin without the ledger? Um, I'm n I don't know. I have no, I have no idea. Open Dime, which makes it act like a bearer instrument, although temporarily. Open Dime, just like uh, anyone he heard of this? Yeah, it's a little USB Bitcoin. key, right? Yeah, you just put it. You put the coins or the private key and the and the what it, you put the private key on like a little USB stick, then you have to break this tab off.